Okay, so we're going to solve this problem where we need to find out how many real solutions there are to this equation. And the approach we'll take involves a lot of sketching graphs to understand what's going on. So instead of treating this all as one function which is equal to zero, we'll actually split this up into, first of all, sine of x plus 8 all over x squared. And equivalently, we want this to be equal to 2 minus x squared. So we'll treat this as one function is equal to another, so that then we're looking at the graph of sine x plus 8 over x squared, and similarly for this quadratic. But before we get onto the graphs, there's something really useful we can do to simplify the problem here. So you'll spot that sine of a real function is just going to be between positive and negative 1. And that tells us then that we're only interested in values of x, so that 2 minus x squared is also between positive and negative 1. So this is really useful now because if we can find these values of x, we can simplify the problem a lot and just focus on those certain values of x. So if we wanted to have a look at a graph of y equals 2 minus x squared, where is this going to be between positive and negative 1? We've got a y-intercept at 2, so we're interested in, in between positive and negative 1. So we're going to be interested in this region here and also this region here. So how do we find the values of x? Well, we could just solve 2 minus x squared is equal to 1, and 2 minus x squared is equal to minus 1. So if you've got 2 minus x squared equals 1, this tells us then that x would be equal to plus or minus 1. So that gives us these two points for our region. And similarly, 2 minus x squared equal to minus 1 tells us then that x squared has got to be equal to 3, so x would be plus or minus the square root of 3 for these two points down here. So then we can just read off that the values of x that we're interested in are going to be between minus root 3 and minus 1, or between 1 and root 3. And now for these values of x, we'll actually look at how x plus 8 over x squared behaves, so what values it takes. And this will tell us about how sine of x plus 8 over x squared behaves and the values taken by that in our region of interest. So we've got an asymptote when x is 0, but fortunately that's not in our range of values, so we don't care too much about that. And what we'll do is we'll look for, is this increasing, is it decreasing, are there any turning points, just to get a feel for what values are being taken there. So if we write this as 1 over x plus 8 over x squared, just splitting into two fractions, this tells us then that dy dx is just going to be minus 1 over x squared minus 16 multiplied by the 2 over x cubed, then we can take this all into a single fraction, we get minus x minus 16 all over x cubed. So then in our first region between 1 and root 3, our positive region, if x is here between 1 and root 3, let's have a look at dy dx. We have something negative in the numerator divided by this will be something positive in the denominator. So dy dx is actually going to be negative. So dy dx is going to be strictly negative. So we have a some sort of strictly decreasing function in this range. And then if we look at x between minus root 3 and minus 1, what happens to dy dx there? Well, you have a negative, but the negative of a negative. But this is still going to give you a negative in the numerator. So the numerator doesn't become positive until x gets all the way down to minus 16. And our denominator is going to be a negative cube, so that gives us a negative. So we've actually got a negative over a negative. So that tells us then that dy dx is going to be strictly positive, and we've got some sort of strictly increasing picture in this region. So this is really nice now, because then we can say in each region, so first of all, where x is between 1 and root 3, we increase from when x is 1, x plus 8 over x squared is just going to be 1 plus 8 over 1, so 9. So this is going to go up to 9, then it goes all the way down when x is root 3, because it decreases, root 3 plus 8 over root 3 squared, so just root 3 plus 8 all over 3. So this gives us our range of values taken by x plus 8 all over x squared in our first interval. And for our second interval, where x is now negative, between minus root 3 and minus 1, x plus 8 over x squared increases, so it starts off when x is minus root 3, we have minus root 3 plus 8 all over root 3 squared, gives us 3 again, and then this will increase up to when x is minus 1, you have minus 1 plus 8 over 1, so you get 7. So we've now found all the values taken by x plus 8 over x squared. 
So what happens to sine of x plus 8 all over x squared? Well, to picture this, we'll draw a graph here of y equals sine u, and then we'll think about what happens to u equals x plus 8 over x squared. So u, this x plus 8 over x squared, it decreases down from 9 to this root 3 plus 8 over 3. So we'd start off at 9, somewhere just short of 3 pi, and as u decreases, you can see sine would go up to 1, then down to minus 1. We need to think carefully about where this root 3 plus 8 all over 3 actually lies on our picture. We know that root 3 is just a little bit more than 1.7, it's 1.7 squared is just less than 3. So this tells us then that root 3 plus 8 all over 3 is going to be a little bit more than 9.7 over 3, which is just more than 3.2, which very conveniently is just more than pi. So we'll actually get a point somewhere around here, just beyond pi. And when we have 9 is x plus 8 over x squared, we start off here. So we're saying as x increases from 1 up to root 3, sine of x plus 8 over x squared will start off here just above 0. It will go up to 1, it will go down to 0, down to minus 1, then increase again, but it will stop before it gets to 0. So this is really useful now because we can actually draw a sketch of y equals sine x plus 8 over x squared in our first region. So if we label on now 1 and minus 1, this is going to start off when x is equal to 1, we'll start off just below 1, then we increase up to 1, so we go up and there's a turning point somewhere around here, then we go all the way down to negative 1, and then start increasing again, but we stop before we get to 0. So this is when x is root 3. This is really useful now because we can actually add in y equals 2 minus x squared to our drawings. If we add in y equals 2 minus x squared, we know that when x is 1, 2 minus x squared is 1, and when x is root 3, 2 minus x squared is going to be minus 1. And we can just connect these with a nice curve like this. We know this is a quadratic. And you can see because we start off at 1 and then our sine x plus 8 all over x squared increases above our quadratic, then it decreases below, then it finally finishes off above, we'll see that we get exactly three real solutions in this region of interest. And then we'll focus on our second one next. So we could make this step with the intersections, perhaps by considering the difference between these two functions. We can make this a little bit more rigorous using the intermediate value theorem, but just pictorially, hopefully this is quite intuitive. You go above, then below, finish above, so there have to be three real solutions in this first interval. And now we can apply the same sort of strategy for our second region of interest. So we know that here, as x goes from minus root 3 to minus 1, x plus 8 all over x squared increases from minus root 3 plus 8 over 3 up to 7. So we can think, what is the actual value of minus root 3 plus 8 over 3? Well, using the approximation minus root 3 is around minus 1.7, this is going to be roughly equal to 6.3 over 3, which is 2.1. And then we know that this is between pi over 2 and pi. So we'll start off perhaps somewhere around here on our graph. So when x is minus root 3, sine of x plus 8 over x squared starts here. It goes down all the way to minus 1, and it increases up again. But then by the time we get to x plus 8 over x squared is equal to 7, this is between 2 pi and 2 and a half times pi, so we don't quite reach this turning point here. So sine of x plus 8 over x squared in the second region starts off between 1 and 0, it goes down to minus 1, and it finishes off somewhere between 1 and 0. So using this, we can now get a sketch going for y equals sine x plus 8 all over x squared in our second region of interest. So if we label on the graph again, y equals 1 and minus 1, we start off when x is minus root 3 and go all the way along to where x is minus 1. So we'd start just below y equals 1. Then we would decrease all the way down to minus 1. And then we would increase up again, but not quite reaching 1, stopping somewhere around here. So we have a turning point down where y is minus 1. So now we can add on to our sketch, just like before, y is 2 minus x squared. So we know that when x is minus 1, 2 minus x squared is 1. And we know when x is minus root 3, 2 minus x squared is minus 1. Then we can finish off the picture just by drawing in the curve like this, and you see you get one real solution. The only technicality here is we actually we haven't really shown that the quadratic and the sine curve don't intersect before the turning point, perhaps with a picture like this, giving 
two extra solutions. We haven't really shown this about the curvature of sine x plus 8 all over x squared. However, we can show that if we start off working from right to left now, when x is minus 1, we can show that we reach our negative values before y equals 2 minus x squared has even reached the original starting value, so this would be sine 7 here. And then we can also show that we reach this turning point well before y equals 2 minus x squared becomes negative. So there's no chance of any interaction between the two graphs in this region. And then once we've reached the turning point, we've got an increasing function intersecting a decreasing function, so they can only intersect in one point. So there's no chance that this will curve away and meet here because y equals 2 minus x squared is just so much bigger than y equals sine x plus 8 all over x squared. So we only get one real solution in the second interval. So then combining that with our three real solutions from our first interval, we have four total real solutions to our original equation.